This is the Mile High Five podcast with Carl Jensen and Doug Cunnington. We have authentic conversations about the journey to Phi, health, happiness, and some very odd tangents. We interview Phi experts, side hustlers, people on their way to Phi, and those who have reached the other side. Join us every week, and if you want the show notes and links and all that other stuff, head over to milehighfi.com. Hello, world. Welcome to the Mile High Fi Podcast. I'm Carl Jensen with my co-host. I'm Doug Cunnington. So today we are going to be talking to Brian Frawley, who is a financial educator, investing enthusiast, and author. He's written over 3,000 articles on stocks, investing, and personal finance for The Motley Fool. Brian's best-selling book, Why Does the Stock Market Go Up, was published in 2022. It was written to explain how the stock market works in plain English. Welcome to the podcast, Brian. Carl, Doug, awesome to be here again. Thank you for having me. It was super nice seeing you at Economy. We saw you give a talk there. What did you talk about and what was it like to give a talk there? This might be shocking, but I talked about the stock market and I specifically explained basically my book with in a visual format versus reading format. And I tried to do a half hour presentation that explains what the stock market is, how it works and why it has gone up over the last 250 years. After doing this so many times and thinking about this, does anything continue to surprise you? Do you learn anything when you continue to make content about this? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, I wrote my my book specifically to explain the stock market in simple terms to others. And I find there's no better way to learn a topic than to try and teach that topic to someone else. So, uh, I mean, I've been investing in the stock market for almost 20 years. And when I was writing the book, which is very much designed at beginners, I absolutely learned things about the stock market that I didn't know. And it also helped to crystallize my thoughts, things that I thought I knew. But when you really put them down on paper and organize them, that that's when you really learn something. Super cool. You you have a saying on the back, on the wall behind your head. Does that have anything to do with the stock market? I can't see it with my old eyes. That says, y- yes. an, investment, an investment in knowledge pays the best interest by Mr. Benjamin Franklin. Oh, nice. That is a good one. Well, I, I see on your bio here, so 3,000 articles. Did you... Are you educated as a writer? Like, is that what your major was? Nope. I am not even close to being educated as a, a writer. In fact, if you were to say, when my, my brain is built for logic and for math, that comes natural to me. I was a below average student when it came to writing <laughs> and reading. And if we had a spelling contest, I guarantee that I would lose. So it is really funny and ironic that I end up writing a book. If you, if you were to tell me that I was about to write a book when I was in high school or college, there's no way I would have believed you. Wow. What was your major in college? My major was business, and it was a sub-major called healthcare management. It was essentially the study of health systems, health insurance, and I was planning on becoming a consultant for uh, the healthcare industry. Okay. Mm. Did you end up using your degree? Thank God the answer is no, uh, because if that was my life, it would have been it would have bored me to tears. I was not cut out for that that world that world at all. I went on a couple of job interviews directly because of that major. I didn't get a single offer uh, in that field. And looking back, it's like, boy, thank Great. God, dodge that bullet. Yeah, my wife worked at McKesson for a couple of years, and yeah, she has just a day and a half of work left. So awesome. <laughs> I think you you dodged a bullet. So that sounds like a party is coming at the uh, Doug's house soon. Yeah, yeah, for sure. An endless party. All right, Carl, you want to kick her off? Yeah, Brian. There's one thing that really stands out to me in the outline because I have a similar story and I'm wondering if it's going to be the same fun, but it's your experience buying a hot mutual fund that that then went on to underperform. Tell us about that. So in the 2000s, uh, I was... I slowly became very interested in in investing. I read uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki, and that uh, kickstarted a kind of love affair with all things related to money, personal finance, and investing. And as part of that self-education, you know, back in the 2000s, there were some podcasts, but there certainly weren't podcasts about investing in business like there are today. And there were some YouTube videos, but like the, the amount of content that exists today related to that topic is so much better and so much widespread that existed back then. 
So the way that I educated myself in the 2000s about investing was by reading books. And I was a voracious reader of all investing books. And that included books by Jim Cramer. Uh, and he had several books about in investing. And one of the mutual funds that he highlighted in that book was just like this amazing mutual fund called CGM Focus Fund by a guy named Ken Hebner. And it had delivered like almost 20% annualized returns over the previous 10 years, including 20% annualized turns throughout the dot-com crash. So he was heavily shorting tech stocks and his port, his, his fund out way outperformed and made a bunch of money during the, the dot-com crash. And Jim Cramer was really talking this guy up. So I was like, all right, well, that's where I want my money. This guy clearly knows what he's, he's, he's doing. And as soon as I started putting my money uh, into that fund, you can probably guess what happened to that fund next. The guys, the guy went from being right about the market to being dead wrong about the market. Uh, he was trading frequently in and out uh, of stocks. And uh, basically his fund did absolutely nothing but go flat and down over the pursuing years. So I learned a lesson the hard way that past performance does not guarantee future returns. And this is actually something that I've learned from studying Peter Lynch, for example. Uh, famed investor Peter Lynch delivered fabulous returns over like a 15 year period, something like, I don't know the exact number in the 20%, 20 percent, 20 plus percent annualized returns. And only later did I, did, um, did I learn that the average investor in his fund, in Peter Lynch's fund, uh, dramatically underperformed that return over, over time. And the reason is investor psychology caused them to do all the wrong things. People put money into that fund after it went on a huge run, after it went up a lot, and people poured their capital into it. And all this influx of capital gave, gives the mutual fund manager a problem. Now they have to find a place to put uh, this capital. So they're buying stocks at now inflated prices in order to keep their portfolio the same. But a mutual fund manager might not like a stock at $100 per share the same way they do at $50 uh, per share. And then when the fund underperforms for a period of time, what do people do? They abandon the strategy and they pull their money uh, out. So this is actually fairly common practice with the hottest mutual fund managers of the day. Even if they deliver a market smashing return, the average investor in their fund often dramatically underperforms the markets simply because they're buying that fund at the highs and they're selling that fund at the lows. And that was exactly, exactly the experience that I had with CGM Focus Funds. Interesting. Mine was uh, Munder NetNet. Have you ever heard of that? No, I never have. Yeah, it was a technology fund back around 2000 when all, all the tech stocks were going crazy. I bought it at $10 and it very, very quickly went up to $120. And then, and then just as quickly, it went to zero. So, <laughs> and I, I rode it the whole time. It was like a roller coaster, right? Poof, straight up and then straight down. But it was a good lesson and it was a small lesson. A lesson best learned early on, very early in my investing career. So that was pretty early in, in your investing career, right? Yeah, that was that was before I had kids and before I really knew. Uh, I, I knew a little bit about the market. I knew enough about the stock market to be dangerous, but not enough to do to do invest the right way. Okay, and then so what were like the next couple of years after that? Like, like how did you how did you use that knowledge? Did you absorb it and understand like okay, this is where I fucked this part up, and like we need to do a little bit different next time? So take us through that, like just how that transitioned into whatever you're doing now. Yep. So, so that was in 2007 to 2010 ish, somewhere along those lines. And uh, during that period is when I started to really intensely stu study uh, individual stock uh, selection. And I really started to focus specifically on uh, buying individual uh, businesses. I became a uh, subscriber to um, the Motley Fool's uh, ser services. And one of the wonderful things about the Motley Fool is they have these discussion boards as part of your membership. And it is like a walled garden community of thousands of investors from around the world that are freely sharing information uh, with each other. And the Motley Fool didn't police what was said. So people could give 
um, their open and honest opinion about their portfolio and the recommendations and the services and what they were doing. And I learned more from studying other investors that were posting their their thoughts on these discussion boards uh, than I did from the services th themselves. They were just there are just some fabulous, wonderful individual investors out there that really took the time to put their thoughts on these discussion boards and share and interact with members uh, like me. So I learned a tremendous amount about how to invest the right way by by interacting by interacting with them. And I would say that my my style, which continues to this day, was really honed during that 2007 to 2011 time uh, period. And uh, my style is essentially find great businesses, buy great businesses, do nothing. Hold those great businesses for long periods uh, of time. But it was really uh, it was really from studying what other successful individual investors did uh, during that time period that my current style uh, was developed. Cool. What percentage of your current portfolio is individual stocks versus index funds or any other funds? Yep. So, so all of my retirement funds are in index funds, and that is surely for simplicity uh, purposes. And all, and all of my taxable, all of my taxable funds are in individual stocks. And about sixty percent of my net worth is in my taxable uh, accounts. So, about sixty percent of my net worth is in individual stocks. Okay, I think you'd agree with me on the next point that I think the overwhelming majority of people should not mess around with individual stocks at all. Do you agree with that? Totally agree. I would say 99% of people, 99% of people should just do index funds and call it a day. Yeah, I think it might even be higher. I would say 99.9 because .9, most people, it, it's so difficult because it's so easy to fool yourself. You buy a stock and then the stock goes up. Were you a genius or did you just get lucky? I think most of the times it's luck, but it's easy to convince yourself of something else. Who would you tell to buy individual stocks or what is the right person to actually participate in? Those. Anybody that is interested in learning how to invest properly. That to me is the only requirement that, it, that learning how to invest interests you, that you are willing to put the time and the effort in to do the research, to develop a process, to judge your results, to be open and honest with yourself and to learn. Basically, if, if you're obsessed with investing the same way that I was tw 20 years ago, I was exactly the right human right type of person uh, to go after stock picking because I would rather read an investing book or listen to an investing conference call than watch the next Marvel movie. Like that to me was just more fun. Uh, so I was I was wholly interested in just studying investing as a as a passion uh, pro project. So that to me is the only requirement that you are literally interested enough in the topic to do the work necessary. And can you talk about your performance versus say S and P five hundred or a broad index fund? H however, you're measuring against like not individual stocks. Sure. I don't know. I don't have the exact figures off the top of my head. I'm ha happy to look them up in a little bit if you give me a couple of minutes. I changed brokers to my current broker, which is Interactive Brokers, starting in 2012. So tracking my performance before then is a little bit tricky, but that's basically 12 plus years of data at this point. And at, and the last I looked, I'm over 200% ahead of the S&P 500 during that, uh, during that time frame. Cool. Yeah. Nice the S&P 500 is my benchmark because that is what I would invest in if I wasn't doing what, what I'm doing. So that, that's the benchmark that I'm trying to beat. Okay. So it's like 18% return annually, roughly something like that. If you're that's, saying that, 9%. That sounds, that sounds in the ballpark. I think the okay. S&P 500 is roughly 14% over that time period. And okay. I'm like 17%, something like that. Seven, that's six, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome, Brian. Holy shit. Yes. Super cool. You made an interesting, you said something interesting. I said, who should invest in stocks? And you said, someone who is interested to do the work. So the work is what interests me because it's so diverse. What could make one person successful? The work or research to make one person successful could be completely different for someone else, right? I guess it depends on your strategy, what you're trying to achieve. So how do you define the work? <laughs> is, if yeah, this is a shitty question, don't, don't answer. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. So to, to me, there are some table stakes that you need to have before you should even stock, start considering doing, doing investing. So to me, personal finances come first. So I'm going to assume that the person that we're talking about has paid down all their high interest debt, has their uh, HSA health, health insurance taken care of, has an emergency fund, multiple sources of income, yada, 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 all like the basic personal finance stuff taken care of. Once you're at that 
point. And you're, of course, grabbing any match that you get on any uh, tax advantage accounts like a 401k and et cetera. Once we're doing that, the research to me is one, you understand accounting. You understand how to find, read, and interpret financial statements. So an income statement, a balance sheet, and a cash flow statement. And you have at least a basic understanding of what accounting is and how accounting works. If you don't understand accounting, uh, you have no business picking stocks because business, business results, the way that... Uh, Accounting is the report card of a business results. You can tell that a company is doing well by watching its accounting. So step one, understand accounting. Step two, understand SEC filings. How to find and read the most important SEC filings. SEC filings sound complex. They're really not once you get to know them. There's two main ones you need to know. One is an annual report, also called a 10-K. And the second is a proxy statement, which is called def 14A. It's like the worst name ever. Like who picked these things? The annual report will tell you a tremendous amount about the business, the competitive advantage, the opportunities, the risks, the financial statement, the management team, et cetera. And the proxy statement will tell you everything you need to know about the management team. Who owns the stock? What are their incentives? What are their bonuses uh, based off of? And, and are they aligned with the shareholders of, of that business? So once you understand the business, the financials, the opportunity, the management, and the risks, then I think you at least have a starting point for knowing if an investment is good or not. Ooh, so interesting. So I've bought stocks without paying attention to much of any of that. I guess my best example would be just because I think this company has such a massive, huge moat and they're so far ahead, it's SpaceX. So I don't know anything about their financials. And I think a lot of it's private because they're not publicly held. <laughs> do, do you think I'm nuts for doing such a thing? No, I don't, because I know you, Carl, and I know that you are on extremely f sound uh, financial footing. So if this, if that investment goes to zero, it's not going to harm you financially in any way. You've done enough of the, or the the work that if if this if this bet you're making doesn't pay off, you're you're going to be absolutely you're going to be absolutely fine, and you know what risks you're taking going into the. The, the investment. So if you want to take a portion of your portfolio and speculate on, on companies, and by the way, Tesla, SpaceX is like $90 billion or something like that. Like it's a massive company. So it's, it's, it's not like you're taking a flyer on some like $10 million startup. Like it is a big, well-known, established, wide mode business. So no, I don't think you're crazy for doing so. Okay, cool. Do you have any follow-ups, Doug, before we get into the next part? Just a quick little plug. So, Brian, you have a YouTube channel, right? And you, you cover a lot of sort of topics in individual investing, right? If people want to learn a little bit more and go deeper, is that a good place for them to, to follow you? Yep, absolutely. Yeah, we, we do earnings coverage on, you know, 15 or so stocks that are very popular on there. And if you want to interested in our process for how we judge earnings, break down earnings and uh, judge a company's results. Yeah, we do. We do uh, regular updates there. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. We'll link up to that. Great channel. So there is one group of investors I see frequently on Twitter or X or whatever we're supposed to call it, who seem to defend their style with religious fervor. I've seen fights descend into like profanity and people yelling, and these are dividend investors and maybe dividend growth investors. Why do you think that these, this particular group is so fanatical about it? Or, or are they not? Am I just seeing something incorrectly? No, people, people can get pretty fanatical about their investing style once they've gone through the work of saying, this is my in investing style. Um, once that idea gets into their head, it can be natural to want to fight away people that say that's suboptimal or they're, they're knocking anything wrong with it. I mean, dividend investing can be a great uh, way to to invest. And, and the appeal of it is very high, right? You buy something and then that asset gives you an income stream in theory, in perpetuity, and even better with dividend with dividends, that income stream uh, can grow over time and it can grow at a rate that exceeds uh, inflation. And if you buy the right dividend stocks, not only can you earn income along the way, you could potentially earn pretty meaningful capital gains uh, as well. So I see nothing wrong with uh, investing in dividends, but I would not be, to me, a dividend is a capital allocation decision, right? Management teams of profitable businesses generate profit, and then management teams have full, have many choices over what they can do with that, that profit. 
One of those choices is to give that cash to shareholders as a cash payment, aka a, a, a dividend. And there are lots of reasons that shareholders like that because without selling, they earn an income stream from their uh, investments. However, depending on market conditions and opportunities, paying a dividend might not be the most optimal use of capital. Uh, we have seen Warren Buffett, famously for what, 50 something, 60 years now, has refused to pay a dividend to Berkshire shareholders. That was the correct thing to do because retaining capital inside Berkshire could be redeployed internally and through acquisitions at a higher rate of return that would generate a far superior return for shareholders than just paying it out as a dividend. A dividend to me is like the last choice that a management team uh, sh should have when they're allocating capital. Well, first off, you could just keep the capital on hand. You could just build cash uh, for, for a rainy day or to go on offense when, when market conditions arise. You can buy back stock, but you should only do so when your stock is at an attractively priced uh, level. You could make an acquisition to bring in a technology or acquire a um, complementary business that could strengthen your competitive advantage. You can invest in research and development to develop new products and new, new services. You can pay down debt if the company has any debt. And if all of those options are unattractive given market conditions or, or business um, realities, then the choice should be, well, let's take a portion of this and give it back to the shareholders in form of, of a dividend. So to me, a dividend is just a capital allocation decision. Sometimes it's the right choice. Other times it's not the right choice. Do you have any dividend producing stocks in your portfolio? Yes, it is not a major is not a major area of focus for me. So I own something like 50, 50 stocks or so, and I would wager that five or six of them pay a dividend. Okay. And did you get them because of the dividend or because you saw a, a good price, a good company, all the things you outlined before? In many in many of the cases, I bought them before they paid a dividend, and then they held them, and then they actually initiated a, a dividend, uh, which is something that's fairly common as as businesses grow and mature. Sometimes they they are more profitable than they know what to do with, and they start paying a dividend to investors. So a couple of my holdings, when I bought them, did not pay a dividend, but now they do. We have a sponsor today, Ghostbed, and our, our buddy Rich, who we got to hang out with in economy. It was cool to meet him in person because he's a big supporter of the show. And we, we've been waiting. You guys got your new bed and you and Mindy have been testing it out. You were telling me um, you guys tested it out, right? Yeah, we have tested it out. We haven't slept on it. Or I know, I know Ooh, where you're I know going with this, means. Doug. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We haven't done that, but I have some video that perhaps we can <laughs> splice into this. It is G-rated. It shows us unboxing the bed and laying on it and having a, a conversation at it, it'll be fun. Yeah. Okay. Let's place and, it in here. And you had, you already had the camera mounted on the ceiling, you said, so it was no big deal to get the overhead shot. Yes, that's right. It's right next to the mirrors and yeah, some of the other devices we have in the, in the basement. <laughs> so, uh, what, which, which mattress did you get? Why did you get a mattress? Just kind of expand a little. Yes. So this is the ghost bed classic. This will be a mattress for our guest bedroom. The reason why we got it is it is only seven inches thick and it kind of has to fit into a tight storage area. So it can go in our closet when we don't have guests and can free up space in there. Some of the other ones are a little bit thicker. I think they go up to like 12 or 13 inches maybe. And that one would have been a little bit harder to store. So this one is easy to manage, easy to move with two people. So when we have to break it out for a guest, it'll be super easy to set it up. And it, it feels like a High quality mattress. It's nice to lay on in the, the time we've laid on it. We haven't had the sleeping test, and I know that we're going to have a sleepover, Doug. You're going to come over, and we're going to make popcorn, watch movies. Hallmark and, movies, I think. Yeah. That's what I was promised. Yeah, Hallmark movies, whatever you want, Doug. And yeah, we'll put a big demarcation line down the middle, so I want you to keep out of my space. It's only a queen. Like, I sleep on a king usually, so this will mm. be... A little bit tighter. Um, I know you like to cuddle at night, but please bring your body pillow for that. I, I don't want to be your body pillow. Okay. And you, you have one, right? You have a body pillow. I do. I do. I, I wonder if Ghostbed sells one of those. I should. We should look into that. Take a look. It's shaped like a ghost. No, yeah. I don't know. I don't, we, we need to look. But they do have a full range of products over there. And, and quick note, I don't like a huge mattress either. So seven inches seems like a reasonable size. But you know, some of them are so huge. It's like you have to get a little stepladder to get up into your bed, you know. But I think, you know, 
a normal seven inches is probably about right. Yeah, I, I definitely think so. This one would be good. I, I don't think they have an RV product now yet, but... No, I think they do. They have the RV mattress, don't they? Okay. Yeah, shows what I know. This one would be great <laughs> for something like that. Or, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So, quick note, it's a family-owned business with 20 years of experience, or over 20 years of experience. They have 60,000 five-star reviews, and their mattresses are super comfortable. They have a wide range. So if you like the thick ones or you like the the more lower profile or even an RV mattress, they also have all the accessories, sheets, pillows, other things you might need in your bed. I don't know. I think that might be Adam and Eve, but they're not sponsoring the show. <laughs> Yet. And, all right. And they ahead. come in different comfort levels too. Like I like, I prefer a cushier pillow or a cushier mattress, but if stiff is what you want, you can get that as well. Yeah, I, I like the stiff ones, I think. And you can get a 101-night at-home sleep trial, 20-plus year warranty, and you could save 50% if you go to ghostbed.com slash milehighfi with the code milehighfi at checkout. Cool. And we'll get back to the interview with Brian. You brought up Berkshire. Are you going to the conference this year? Or? I am not going to the conference this year. I've it's It's been on my to-do list forever, and... I've heard it's such a wonderful time, but I do not have plans to go there this year. Okay, cool. I think they have over like a hundred billion in cash now, right? It's crazy. Do you know the number off the top of your head, or the approximate? Uh, I, I, I know it's well over a hundred billion, so I, I know wow. it's I know it's a big number. Yeah, it'll be super interesting to see if Warren can figure out what to do with that because it's just a massive, such a massive amount of money. It's hard to move the needle when you get that big. Yeah, one hundred sixty-seven yeah. billion is what they have in cash. Wow. Wait, what can we draw from that? Like any conclusions? Like they're holding on? Does that mean there's not as many good deals out there? Or what do you think, Brian? Yeah. So if you look back at Warren Buffett's history, he 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 essentially has two modes. Uh, mode one is operate the business and build cash. And that is when Warren is scouring the landscape and says, there's no attractive opportunities for Berkshire to make investments right now. So in 2014, Berkshire had $61 billion in cash. Now they have $167 billion in cash. Over the last 10 years, they've added over $100 billion in cash. And that's while they built up a massive equity stake in Apple, for example. So it's not like they weren't making investments during this period or even acquiring other businesses. So that to me means that Warren Buffett is doing the thing that he always does, which is waiting for some calamity to come across that takes down market prices. And then once that happens, like he did in 2008, I'm assuming he's going to put a whole bunch of cash to work in a very short period of time. Carl, do you have anything to add? <sighs> Boy, that's what Warren Buffett said to Charlie Munger. Do you have anything to add? That was uh, Warren Buffett's <laughs> really? tagline. Are you implying? I hope that doesn't mean I'm going to be dead soon. Man. I, I love Charlie Munger. I thought he was uh, more profound than Warren Buffett. Have you ever read Poor Charlie's Almanac, Brian? Or? Many times. It's one of my favorites. Yeah, Charlie Munger is such a wonderful human uh, to study, let alone let alone investor. He was just full of wisdom. Absolutely. And that's what makes him great. The, the thing I always found profound about him in the Berkshire, I'm pretty sure it was a 2012 annual letter. Warren Buffett talks about how he was a disciple of Benjamin Graham, who taught him to buy great companies or no, okay companies at a great price. And Charlie Munger taught him to buy a great company at an okay price. So kind of the inverse. And and then Warren Buffett said that Charlie Munger is the architect of the current version of Berkshire Hathaway, which is crazy. Like he's basically giving Charlie all the credit for what Berkshire Hathaway looks like now, the modern version of it. I don't think people realize that. Yeah, they, I don't think many people realize because Warren Buffett is obviously the face of Berkshire Hathaway and Right Free Slow, just how much of an impact Charlie Munger had o o over the years. And you are 100% correct that he succeeded at changing Warren Buffett's mind. Warren Buffett, Mr. Mr. Value Investor, Mr. Cigar Butt Investor, Mr. Benjamin Graham Disciple, slowly leaned, leaned away from using that investing style. And that caused him to make many of the best investments that Berkshire has ever made. Yeah, it's amazing. Like Munger was responsible for BYD, which no one knew their name until very recently. And I think he bought it like over a decade ago, which is pretty crazy. Yep. And I think it's a 10 plus X return for him during that yeah. time too. Warren Buffett, the growth investor, who would have known? <laughs> well, before we move on, who, well, 
I'll, I'll leave it a little bit open, but there's some pros and cons for dividend investing. Who might it be a good option for if someone is interested in exploring dividend investing? Yeah, anyone that's really after income. So it's a very good choice for people that are, you know, o- older in age and don't want to sell their portfolio and are happy to take a higher than normal income stream in exchange for a lower than normal capital appreciation returns. For many investors, that is an acceptable that is an acceptable trade-off. Or people that are just interested in income. There's absolutely nothing wrong with with dividend with dividend in investing. And if that's what you want to do, I say I say go for it. Just know ahead of time that dividends is a capital allocation choice. And in some cases, it's not always the best choice. Always trade-offs. Yes. Correct. Cool. So I, so Doug and I saw you speak at Economy, and you're always a super good speaker. If anyone ever has a chance to see Brian speak, I highly suggest you do it. We saw you speak at FinCon a couple of years ago, giving a talk about Twitter, and then at Economy, giving a talk about why the stock market goes up, which was super good. And one of the things you mentioned, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but I I believe the number one reason for economic expansion, why VTSAX is up and to the right, is productivity. Is is that correct? That's a major component of of it. Yeah, productivity, which is generally, generally speaking, humans get better at making stuff with fewer inputs over over time. And if you look back at the history of farming, for for example, you know, 150 years ago, the technology of the day was a uh, a horse or an ox that was drawing a plow, which was like revolutionary technology compared to hundreds of years before. And now everything is mechanized. And if you've ever watched a documentary on how food is produced, it is truly draw dropping the, the gains that we've had in producing food per, per acre of parcel. So absolutely, productivity is a major, major driver of, of human prosperity, period. Cool. And it, what's super interesting about your farming comment, and I think at like 1900, something like two thirds of people were farmers, and now it's like 13% or something like that are involved in agriculture. Because of what you said, the productivity, now we have tractors and I, I have family who are farmers and I'm like, what's it like being a farmer? They're like, you know, it's actually... Uh, it gets a bad press, but the tractor drives itself. Now we, we don't even have to yeah. drive the tractor. It's uh, you're closer to a computer scientist than a farmer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> life is pretty good, and the the tractor even has this uh, AI algorithm on it where it will identify weeds and actively like spray the weeds versus like the crops, so selectively treat the weeds while it's driving itself, which is insane, mm-hmm. right? Super yeah. cool. So the question I wanted to ask you at, at Economy is, I think perhaps the biggest productivity increaser we've ever seen is upon us, and that's artificial intelligence and all this stuff that's coming on us right now. These are the four most dangerous words in investing, but I think it might actually be different this time. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm reading Morgan Howells' book, The Same as Ever, and I realize what I'm saying is in direct opposition to that, perhaps. But have you thought about AI and how it's going to change and it's going to change society as well. But just what about investing and the stock market? Well, I, I've been an investor in Tesla for 10 years. So I don't know. So, uh, yes, I have a keen interest in, in related to a- AI. And it is it is truly mind boggling the ways that AI could impact our, our lives. I mean, you mentioned productivity, but think about think about health care. Think about education. The AI has the has the potential to disrupt tons of, of industries it could be as impactful on humanity as as the internet was on humanity 20 20 plus years uh, 20 plus years ago um, in, in my talk Carl you may remember one of the th- one of the main drivers of the stock market over 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 time is population growth and population growth for the last you know 150 years has been two to three uh, percent growth per year and if you look at the 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 numbers that are coming out uh, more recently there are several major economies in the world that are actually having population declines they're actually at peak population or on the way uh, down so for many stock markets around the world population could be could transition from being a a booster to the stock market return to a headwind uh, for the stock market uh, return, which might not, which could mean, could mean that returns for the stock market moving forward might not be as high as they have been in the past. But what you brought up with AI and productivity, if AI lives up to its productivity potential, that could more than compensate for that headwind um, that uh, the population decline or the population stagnation, I guess I should say, does have on us. And it, 
the, the potential to have productivity increase by, by leaps and bounds could mean wonderful things for the stock market. You hinted at Tesla. I'm going to take a quick diversion here. Have you tried the new FSD 12.3 yet? Uh, I just got it. I do have a Model Y and I just got it, but I have not tried it yet. Have you? Yes, I have. It drove like 40 miles around Longmont with one disengagement due to a lane issue. It got into a right turn lane when it shouldn't, and I wasn't sure what it's going to do. for. So for safety's sake, I disengaged it. But it's it's night and day. There was one super cool incident that happened. I was on a, going down Main Street, and there were pedestrians that were about to enter a crosswalk, and they didn't hit the button to change the light that would have given them permission but the car saw the car next to me slowing down, or it might have seen the people, and it slowed down, even though they were occluded for part of the time and waited for these people to go across the crosswalk. Was it, it pretty good? Yeah, it, it, it was wow. mind-blowing. I'm like, wow. Like, right there, there was an incident last year where a child was run over with the exact same thing. She was walking in front of a car to the right, and the person to the left didn't know there was a kid there, so the car ran them over. And in this case, the car prevented that same thing. Not that I, I, I did see the people. I would not have run them over, but the car saw them, which was super impressive. Wow. Very cool. Very cool. I'll, I'll give it a try later today then. Yeah. Yeah. Do you guys have like the same, like, I know both model Ys, but is it like pretty comparable what you guys have? Like same year and stuff like that, roughly? I got mine in 2020. So I think you got yours more recently, Raquel, right? Yes, I've got a newer version of the hardware, but Tesla has not optimized the FSD software for my version of the hardware yet. So they're pretty much the same. Gotcha. Yeah, so we are, yeah, my, my, my car can run the same software. So we have, it, it should be from a feature perspective, the same. Pretty cool. Yeah, the, this AI stuff, I keep... Th- going back to it because I think there's the potential for it to take away a lot of jobs and maybe we finally arrive. Who was the guy? I'll back up a second. Like John Maynard Keynes, I think in 19, around 1915, he said a hundred years from now, people will only have to work like, I can't remember. You probably know this better than me, Brian. Yeah. 15 hours a week. And it seems like we might actually be upon that. And I'll back up a second. When farming came, when farming went away because of automation, people had other jobs to move to. Farming was the main thing that was eliminated. But now I see AI being able to eliminate many, many more jobs, especially if you apply it to hardware like the Tesla bot or other robots or machines. It's, I think there might be something big upon us. That is entirely possible. And, you know, one of the flip sides of productivity, if everybody, if, if everybody uses AI to become way more, way, way more productive, then in theory, that will cause output to go up dramatically for, for everybody. If that, if output goes up dramatically uh, for everybody, you know, we live in a competitive society. So in theory, that could lead to lower prices, lower prices for consumers at the end. So while there could be massive amounts of job displacement, Placement and job disruption. One, that should lead to whole new categories of jobs. Brand new job opportunities will open up uh, because of AI. But two, if productivity does increase, the cost of living could go down dramatically across the board for everybody, which would be absolutely wonderful for, for humans. So Brian, you're a content creator. You're an author. How do you use AI in your day-to-day or week-to-week workflow? Yeah, I, I, I use it every day. I use it. I, I create content. So I, I use it to come up with, with ideas. I use it to format. I use it to do, uh, to do research on, on content that I have. So yeah, it, it, ChatGPT has become a major part of my workflow. Awesome. And have you played around with like Claude or Gemini as well, or pretty much sticking to ChatGPT and you have it trained ChatGPT up with your... ChatGPT to me is, is the market leader and yeah. uh, it's, you know, I'm, I'm a paying subscriber to it. So I, I'm sure that Gemini and Copilot and all those other ones are, are fantastic. But until I see a major reason to switch, I, I, I don't think I will. Okay. Yeah. I'm primarily on ChatGPT. Yeah. I pay for it too. Yeah. It's, it's so amazing. So when you, um, whatever you have some ideas, you're doing some research, how do you use it? If you can go like step-by-step step and geek out, like, do you ask questions? Do you have ChatGPT ask you questions? How do you, how do you work with like your initial idea and then improve it over time? Yep, sure. So, so I one thing that I do on LinkedIn, for example, is I make infographics. I produce basically a financial infographic every single day on there, and uh, I come up with the uh, initial idea for the infographic, and I have a big database of ideas that I that I keep in there, and then I take those ideas, and then I plug the ideas into ChatGPT to say. 
hey, ChatGPT, here's an idea. How can I format this for an infographic? Essentially create the instructions to give to a designer that can take this idea and turn it into an in infographic. And ChatGPT workshops that, that for me. And then I kind of take that, I edit it myself. I give that to my graphic designer. She comes up manually with a with a graphic design and then it goes back to me and then I do the I do the finalized work but I use ChatGPT to for for ideation or another thing that ChatGPT is really good for is analogies so you can say how can I explain this topic like like uh, to a 5 year old or how can you take this complex topic and explain it in an easy way say so give me five analogies that I can use and it's actually really creative and really good at coming up with analogies that, that you can use though that's the major way that I use it very good what else are you working on? Do you have another book in you, Brian? Oh God, books are so painful. Like they're so painful to pr produce. So again, I, I I never set out to become an author. Like Morgan Housel, like he's like I'm an author. Like that's what he does. And some people, um, they just they just write a book and then they write another book and they write another book. Writing this book was writing a book is very painful. So the only reason I wrote my book was because. I wanted it to exist in the world more than the pain that would it take to make it exist in, in the world. So if I come across a topic that I, I, I am extremely passionate about, so much so that I'm like, yes, I will go through that pain, I, I would write another book, but I have, I have yet to find a topic that fires me up as much about the, um, the initial one. Cool. All right. Anything else? Yeah, I'm not. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about, Brian? Uh, we're at the end of our talking points. No, I just want to say I love you guys. You, you guys do such a great job, and it was awesome to to see you in economy. I hope that hope that you guys will be at FinCon so we can uh, keep the party going. Yeah, we will. I, I guess I have one last question for you, which I thought was pretty good from your outline. Where do you find new investing ideas? Are you reading the news? Where do you get those? Where do you? What is your source? Yeah, there's lots of places that you can get investing ideas. And uh, if you know what you're doing, you can soon be overwhelmed. With, you, you should have more investing ideas than, than you do capital to, to invest. That would be that, that should be a problem that every investor has. We have more ideas than we do capital. So there's lots of places to get uh, investing ideas. One of my absolute favorite places to get investing ideas is by stealing ideas from other investors that you really love seeing. I mean, this is something that Charlie Munger has said, God bless the SEC, because with the SEC, fund managers are required by law to disclose their holdings publicly every 90 days to, to to investors. So they, they do so through 13F filings, which is a complex sounding SEC term, but there are sites like Datorama and whalewisdom.com. Both of those sites, you can go on there and for free, look through the holdings of big investors that you admire. So I have a slew of investors whose styles that I really admire. And every 90 days, I go through their holdings to see what changed, what did they add to, what did they sell? And that right there is a pre-vetted list of stocks that, that passed the hurdle rate of some investor that I admire. So you can bet that they have something going for and that deserves some more research. That's way one. Way two is a little bit more uh, geeky, but if you know about exchange-traded funds, there are thousands of exchange-traded funds out there and they, they get down into like the nitty-gritty of, of certain details. Like You can get into funds that just focus on cybersecurity stocks, uh, for example, or, or funds that focus just on plant-based um, plant meat companies, that, that kind of thing. So if there's a trend that, that I come across that I'm really bullish on, for example, against cybersecurity, I will do the research to find ETFs that are a play on that trend. And then I will look at the holdings uh, of those ETFs, which also must be reported. And that can be another great place to find investing ideas that are already from a theme that you think is, is really important. The, the SEC and cracking open uh, ETFs are two places that you can have endless investing ideas for free. Cool. You said you like to look at people who you admire. Can you give us a couple people who you've been paying attention to lately? From invest investing perspective, I assume? Yes. Yep. So obviously there's Berkshire Hathaway and that would be uh, Warren Buffett and all of his uh, lieutenants are, are on there. Uh, one investor who I admire greatly is a guy named Terry Smith. Uh, Terry Smith is basically the quote unquote Warren Buffett of the UK. Uh, he runs a fund called Fund Smith and he is a long-term high quality buy and hold 
investor, very much in the style of, of Warren Buffett. So his fund is called Fund Smith, and he has outperformed the indexes over time. And he basically buys, buys companies, and his turnover rate is something like 5% per year, which means on average, he holds a holding for 20 years, if you, if you take the inverse of that. Um, so his portfolio, I look through another investor that's right there in that same vein is Chuck Aker or Chuck Akre, A-K-R-E. He runs the Aker Focused Fund. Uh, that is another fund, long-term, buy and hold, high quality businesses. And then a final one I'll throw out there is Poland Capital Management, P-O-L-E-N. They have a high quality growth fund that's run by Dan Davidowitz, I'm pretty sure is his name. Uh, another long-term high quality buy and hold fund. So all three of the ones that I mentioned, they're not traders. They they, they buy and they, they make very few portfolio moves over time, less than 10% turnover um, uh, each year, and they own just high quality compounding machines. So great place to get ideas. Super cool. Are you going to be doing anything at FinCon this year? Uh, I have not been picked as a speaker as of yet, but I will certainly apply uh, to get that uh, done. I've done Twitter now uh, twice, so I might switch it up and do a talk on on LinkedIn because I don't think that I've seen a good talk on on that. Um, and then I'll be at um, a company I think called Craft Commerce, which is put on by ConvertKit. Uh, I'll be there in Ju June of this year, and I'll be doing a talk on LinkedIn as well. So those are my creator focused talks for this year. Cool. Gotcha. Is that the one out in Idaho? Is that right? Yes, it is. Yep. Okay. Cool. Awesome. Well, I think we covered everything. Anything else, Brian, before we tell people where they could find you? No, thank you guys so much for having me. I always love uh, hanging out with you guys and I look forward to seeing you at the next conference. It's a blast. Yeah, we'll link up to everything, but uh, where should people go to find you? And you could list them all out or just say one or whatever. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm on Pick a Social Platform. I'm probably on it. My name is Brian Feraldi. And if you want to check out my uh, company website, it's longtermmindset.co. Very cool. And we'll get all the links so it's really easy for people to find it. And yeah, awesome catching up with you, Brian. And we'll talk to you soon. Sounds good. See you, Doug. See you, Carl. Thank you, Brian. Thanks for listening to the show. That was the Mile High Five podcast. And I'm Doug Cunnington, the Balder host. And Carl Jensen is the cool, sexy one. If you dig the show, please do three things for us. Number one, tell a friend, a family member, an enemy about the show, we really don't care who you tell. Maybe forward them a specific show that you know that they will like. It's the single most helpful thing that you can do to spread the word. It's like giving us a virtual high five and uh, actually we don't give high fives in, in person, so the virtual kind's pretty good. And more importantly, your friend or family member or even your enemy will appreciate the fact that you were thinking of them. Number two, make sure you're following or subscribed on your podcast app Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Overcast, YouTube, whatever you're using, and that way you won't miss a show. And number three, please leave us a rating and review. We read them on the show occasionally, and you might hear yours out there on an upcoming episode. Quick disclaimer, this show is not financial or legal advice. I'd actually be surprised if it sounded like it. It's really just for entertainment, and that's at least what we're hoping for. But seriously, get advice from professionals. Carl and I are just two guys with microphones that sit in my basement and talk. So we'll catch y'all next week. Yeah. Brian, did you have a chance to try the Skyline Chili at Economy? So I run a private investing community and one of my community members actually drove down from Indianapolis to take me out and he <laughs> used to live in Cincinnati. So he drove me straight to Skyline Chili and I had it and I am glad I had it. I don't know if I'd be ordering it again, but the, sp the spaghetti and chili part was, was definitely interesting and it came out in like 30 seconds. So more, more positives than negatives. <laughs> Whenever someone says something is interesting, that means not good. It's code for not good. It's fine. It, it was fine. It's not my. It's not my preferred food, but I'm, I'm glad I had it. Yeah, it's like a. It's one of those like regional foods. So totally. it is cool to go check it out. It's like uh, someone was going to Atlanta, where I'm from originally, and they were like, "Anywhere you should check out." And I'm like, "Well, I haven't lived there in a long time, but if you have time, there's a place called the Varsity." which is across the street from Georgia Tech. And it's like an old like drive-in style 
like fast food restaurant. So they have like burgers, dogs, and it's like not that great. And it's still a staple. And if you're like right there and in, in, uh, actually FinCon is going to be in Atlanta this next coming yeah. year. And it's going to be, you know, it might be a mile or two away. I can't quite remember, but um, it would be a place where some people are like, ah, I may check it out, but I'm not going to say like, Hey, it's the greatest burger you ever had. It's like, you know, take some antacids or whatever you need <laughs> to take preventative measures, you know? So yeah. You're selling it, it really well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just make sure you have an iron stomach. And well, Carlin, you've been back many times. In fact, you love that chili so much that you bought some cans at the airport. Yes, I bought cans at the airport. I gave one to Doug and I bought... Uh, so Skyline Chili has a competitor. I think their competitor is called Gold Star and they had a Gold Star mix at the uh, at the airport. So I bought that as well. Maybe I'll, I'll bring it on Friday for Elizabeth's retirement party. <laughs> That'll be good. Well, yeah, we could pour it on some uh, tater tots or something. That's a good way to dress anything right up. 